Sometimes I have a video that gets lots of comments that I think need to be addressed. And this is one case where I need to do a follow-up video and provide some more explanation. So a few weeks ago, I had a video about how to resolve a match problem where I drew out a problem that one of our viewers had and showed how I would solve this or at least get them pointed in the right direction of where this person is related and why they are not sharing DNA. So if you remember this, this is the relationship map that I drew out. And in conclusion, I think what I had is that this M to S and M to B were both like third cousins once removed. And in other words, there was at least a generation between D and M. M was not the daughter of D, but there was another generation in here. Not just one, not just two, but probably a dozen or more people brought up the question, well, what about a half relationship? That might be why this person was not sharing DNA with them. And typically I would agree you should consider this, but we need to go back and take a look at this map and where this half relationship could be. In this, C could be a half sibling of A and the great grandfather. And if that was the case, then we would have a few little changes to make. For instance, in far as relationships, S and B would still be third cousins. F and B would still be second cousins once removed. B to M would now become a half third cousin. And F to M would become a half third cousin, which means F to M would be a half second cousin once removed. Now, the check marks and the X's indicate who shares DNA and who doesn't share DNA. And this still is good because half third cousins don't have to share DNA, but they can share DNA. It's less likely for a half third cousin to share DNA about 60% of the time than just a regular third cousin, which share DNA about 90% of the time. So it's still within the realm of possibility. The other thing, though, to look at also is the amount of shared DNA for a half third cousin is gonna be less than for a third cousin. So that's one way that you could, you might be able to tell how much DNA is being shared. If B and M shared more than 168 centimorgans, then they couldn't be half third cousins. But let's look at another possibility. Let's actually assume that A and C are half siblings of S's great-grandfather. This also changes some things up. Now, S and B become half-third cousins, but remember, they do share DNA. F and B are half-second cousins once removed. B and M are third cousins. S and M are half-third cousins. And F and M are half-second cousins once removed. Again, the check marks and the X's indicate who is sharing actual DNA, and all of these things are possible. And so, to the viewers that said, hey, what about a half relationship here, you're right. That half relationship could explain why DNA was not shared between S and M and F and M. However, the original questioner had already confirmed that the three were all full siblings. And that's why I did not bring up half siblings during the video. But then I got another comment as looking through those comments. Um, the viewer said, there's a slight flaw in your logic when you say that if F shares no DNA with M, then S can't share DNA with M. And that was because S is the daughter of F. And so if F shares no DNA, F cannot pass on DNA to share with S. What if S's mother shares DNA with M through a peripheral relative? And so in other words, S would be related to M both through her father and mother, but she only got DNA through her mother. And that is an interesting, you know, possibility. When we're looking at this, we need to have some research priorities. In other words, there's lots and lots of possibilities, but the probabilities of each one of those possibilities are not equal. If I go and I share 250 centimorgans with a match, if I look on the shared CM tool, you can see that there are 16 potential relationships that are listed. If I assume that I spend an hour researching each one of those relationships to try to figure out which one it is, on average, 15 hours out of every 16 hours I spend is going to be dead ends. In other words, it's going to be, you know, somewhat 
it's somewhat wasted. Now, another way to look at this is, okay, let's look at it over a, a wide range. So I have 10 unknown matches. I spend 16 hours for each match. So I spent 160 hours of research total and I've identified 10 known relationships. So 160 hours to find 10 known relationships. That will help me find everything. But what if I want to do this in a smarter way, I guess you could say. And that is looking at the probabilities. There's a 62% chance that the relationship is actually one of those first five relationships. So I wanna research those ones first. So let me do that now. Now I have 10 unknown matches. I've only spent five hours per match, you know, one hour for each relationship. So 50 hours of research total. And I found six of the known relationships. So I've spent less than a third of the hours to find more than half of the relationships um, as opposed to the other strategy. What if I can actually eliminate some of those relationships right off the bat because of how old they were knowing that, hey, this generation didn't test or anything like that. And I narrow that down to two relationships. Now, if I have that again, 10 unknown matches just like that, I only have to spend two hours per match. So I spent 20 hours of research and now I've still found the same six known relationships. So what I want to say here, and I hope you're seeing is that not all possibilities are equal. And we can spend a lot of time on every possibility, but really we need to prioritize. So in this case, when I'm looking at this, the questioner wants to know whether or not, hey, M being related to S's mom is possible. And the answer is yes, absolutely. That's always a possibility. So my first question though then is which is more likely? And here is our options. S is only related to M through S's father. That's the first possibility. Or S is related to M through both her mother and father. Now there's one simple question you just have to ask yourself. Hey, do you have endogamy? If the answer is no, then there's a very small chance that an unknown match is related to both of your parents. And you can simply do this by looking at your match lists and seeing how many of those are related to both of your parents. Which leads us to question number two then, to help us determine our priority is, how much more likely? So we've determined which one is more likely, but now we want to say how much more likely, because this is where probability makes a difference. Now without endogamy, from me and the research I've done, not just on my own family, but on other people's families, there's only about 1% of those matches that are related to both sides of the family, 1% or less in a lot of cases. That means it's 99 times more likely S is related to M through her father only than S is related through her mother and her father. From a priority standpoint, I'm not even going to worry about this relationship and how that might be because S didn't share any DNA in this case. And so I want to exhaust all possible relationships between F and M before even considering S's mother in this case. Now the questioner's question was, well, if S did have DNA, then it would have to be through her mother because F didn't have it. And yes, that's correct. In this case, S didn't share any DNA. And so the question about whether or not her mother might be related never came up at all, never would have come up at all. On the other hand, if S did share DNA, well, that'd be one of the first things because she has the DNA of her father and her father did not share DNA with M. And so that would mean that S has to share DNA with her mother. Or it could also mean that her father's not really her father, but I'm assuming that since they both have already had their DNA tested, then it's confirmed that that is a father-daughter relationship. As you are researching, make sure you're looking at what priorities you need to be looking at as far as relationships. There's lots of different rabbit holes that you can go down and spend lots of hours researching something that's not gonna get you anywhere. We only have a limited amount of time. Now, if you just like to research just for research sake, then have at it and go whichever way you want. If, however, you have a specific goal in mind of, you know, ancestry you're trying to identify, certain relationships you're trying to identify, then take the time to go over 
what the possibility is and get a rough idea of how probable something is before you go searching down something that really has an extremely low probability when you have lots of other higher probabilities that you haven't looked at yet. Now, if you'd like to learn more about using DNA for research, then you can watch this video up here. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel.